If we try to believe in anything greater than a miracle, it wouldn't be this difficult. If we we try to be a negative ball, yeah, we could be taking control. Hi everybody and welcome back to the channel. I'm Chris and this is Michael. And one of the most frequent questions we get most of all is how were we able to retire early and travel the world as we do? And it's become a little personal recently because we actually have some nieces and nephews who asked, asked us that exact same question. And we also started to think, boy, we wish our younger selves knew the answer to this question. Yeah, this is not about shortcuts. Uh, we're people that worked hard and had successful careers like most folks out there. And so what we're doing is really trying to maximize all that hard work. And although we retired early, take the earnings and, and the things that we did for all those years and make it really last and have great experiences while we're young enough to enjoy them. We will divide the video into three sections. First, how we prepped for early retirement. Second, how we restructured our spending habits in retirement. And third, cover some travel hacks that allow us to travel smarter and may help you as well. We'll structure the discussion around questions that we'll ask and then have transparent conversations with each other just here and see how that goes. But we'd also love to hear about your experiences. So make sure you let us know what you're thinking in the comments. All right, let's get into it. Let's start with how we prepped for early retirement. Mm -hmm. Now, I know a really big thing for us, and this was extremely important for you, was to choose a really great financial advisor. Can you talk about that? You're kind yeah. of our money guy and kind of led that effort. Yeah, so fortunately we live in DC and we have one of the best um, financial managers kind of in the country and they have built a relationship with us for years and we trust them and they get us and they know us. So instead of just having 401ks and, and, and investments kind of roaming around, they do everything for us. They manage it for us and uh, have for years and will continue to. Uh, but I think the most important thing they did is they really got to know what we're trying to do. They got to understand our investment strategies, uh, what we wanted to do in retirement, understood the assets we had, and they built plans. Uh, and those plans take us out until we're 95 years old. They account for inflation and health care and um, you know, retirement, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, long-term care if we get really old. And it really puts all these things into a model that lets us feel very confident that the plan we have uh, and the decisions and investments we made will help us uh, sustain and live the life we want until we're past 95. Now, I know this doesn't apply to everyone, but did they have to make any special considerations given that we're a gay couple? Yeah, you know, before we were married, um, before marriage was legal for us, uh, we had to do a lot of uh, legal documents that gave us, um, you know, kind of things that a traditional marriage was. Now that you're married, um, uh, now that we're married, we have the, um, you know, the benefit of that. But if uh, gay marriage ever became an issue, we would have to, of course, readdress that. We're not too concerned about that in Washington, uh, but it's something you have to pay attention to. Now, one of the things we did in consultation with our financial advisor, uh, but we kind of knew already that we needed to do this, and it was, it was key to our success, was to downsize. Can you talk about how uh, yeah. that played into things? So we mm. had a wonderful home that we loved in D.C. for eight or nine years, and uh, we had it paid off, thankfully. And so when the real estate market really got great in D.C., and we started thinking about this, we made the decision to sell a house that we loved deeply. I mean, really think uh, a house that we thought we would never leave uh, and then bought a place about four blocks away uh, for half the price. Um, and, and in doing that, we not only of course got half our money um, out of the original house and paid cash for the other one, but we were drastically reduced our taxes, our maintenance and all these other things. Mm -hmm. So our monthly outflow really went way down. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we can imagine how this would be a difficult decision for most people out there. But we know for us that 
difference it made for us by it's downsizing. Been great. Even though it was a difficult decision, yeah. uh, the capital it gave us and the savings that it meant for us long term. And the lifestyle. It really, we loved this house. Mm. Like, we loved it. And it was an amazing house on a very Im important, kind of unique street in DC. Um, but walking away from it was very emotional in the beginning and very easy, I think, at the end because we've ultimately wound up in a place that we love on one level that has people there that kind of take care of things, no maintenance, and uh, it's everything we want. Also, we went from having three levels to having one level, so as we age, it's going to be a really good opportunity for us to live there long term. Now, another thing that we did even before we downsized the home was to get rid of our cars. Can yeah. you talk about that decision? Yeah, we were in Chicago for 10 years and had two cars. And then we moved to DC, we got down to one car and we had a garage at our house, but we just weren't using it. In DC, everything's very walkable and uh, a parking's kind of a hassle. So we, even if we could drive or needed to drive somewhere, we didn't want to because we wanted to mess with it. So uh, we got rid of our car eight, years ago so we have no car maintenance no insurance no parking no nothing we walk pretty much everywhere and then if we need to go somewhere we uber uh, mm -hmm. and just get a car where we need mm -hmm. and of course since we're traveling so much i mean we're not missing it a, a, a car enough. would just sit there um and get no use plus i hate to drive and so i don't like to drive so I would do it even if it cost more probably <laughs> but it's a significant savings because obviously we're not there a lot now, one thing that was key uh, to us being able to retire so early, but we realized it's not gonna be the case for everyone out there, is that we only had one child. Michael had one child from a previous marriage, and I have had no kids. So yeah. of course, that saved quite yeah. a bit and allowed for the lifestyle that we have. Can you talk about that? Yeah, kids cost money, and of course they're worth it. Um, but um, my, the one son that I have is uh, 30 years old, and so we don't, our education's done, all of that kind of stuff is done. So we're not worried about education, marriages, kids at home, that kind of stuff. And, and that does burn a lot of money, mm -hmm. and fortunately we don't have to, to spend that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, one thing that was extremely important for you that you preached and the financial advisor was all for it, was that uh, you thought it was important to bank money about two years prior to our retirement. Can you talk about why that was important to us? Yeah, this is, and this is doable. You, it's a change, but one of the things we knew we were gonna retire early. And I also knew that we were younger. So, you know, we're not touching our retirement assets um, and clearly not our 401k until you're 59 and a half. So uh, in the last couple of years, before, while we were still working, we really scrimped and saved and kind of kept and hoarded cash. And the goal was to have a couple of years of living expenses kind of reserved in addition to our usual cash reserves and that kind of stuff for retirement. So uh, the last two years, we made different decisions. We took less vacations. We didn't spend money on stuff. We did a big renovation in our new house, but that was it. And so that allowed us to really save a lot of money. So as we went into retirement, we had a couple of years of living expenses in cash uh, that was ready to go and outside of our retirement assets. One last thing we should add, which was extremely important uh, for our preparation for, for retirement, was that when we lost our two pets, we decided not to get any more. Can you talk and about that? And that was tough. Um, we had two cats for over 17 years, um, and they were our babies, and we loved them desperately. And when we lost um, Tempest, who was the last one um, that we lost, our, our last cat, uh, we chose not to get another cat. Um, so that was difficult because they were such an important part of our family and, and just absolutely meant so much to us. But as we traveled, we knew it wasn't right uh, for the pet or for us. And, um, you know, being gone so much would have just caused hardship and us missing the pet, the pet having to deal with us being gone and that kind of thing. So we made that decision and that decision saves a lot of money. Pets mm -hmm. are expensive. And so we've made the call uh, that while we're traveling like we are, that we won't have any more pets. Maybe someday when we settle down, we'll mm -hmm. have another one. But uh, for now, that's part of our retirement plan. And uh, as kind of a um, 
an Easter egg, if you look through a lot of our videos, one of the things you're going to probably spot is that in every destination we go to, there is some video we of a cat, a cat that we we found. So keep an eye out for those uh, Easter eggs. Uh, they make us very happy and hopefully it'll put a smile on your face as well. Yeah. Let's move into money saving hacks in retirement. Of course, we have modeled to the age of 95 and such, but we have to make sure that our dollar stretches as far as it can in retirement yeah. so that we can stay on that model. So can you tell us about our new mindset of spending in retirement? We are really deliberate about what we spend now. We have time to think about it and we have time to decide if it's really what we want to do. We don't have new money coming in except from our investments. So as an example, we don't buy stuff anymore. Stuff, house stuff, um, expensive wine, uh, I used to collect watches. Uh, we used to do things that just, you know, we did because we were used to doing it and could. And as we reflect on that, we don't need that stuff anymore. We have a smaller house now. We don't have room for a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we don't spend a lot of money on stuff anymore, art, that kind of thing. We just don't have the appetite or the ability to do it anymore and really don't want to because we understand what we want to do instead. And also similar to stuff, there's also memberships. And you'd be yeah. surprised at how many memberships you can collect in the, this day and age. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we used to, we live in DC, so we had a Kennedy, Sim, uh, Kennedy Center membership. Uh, we had both had gym memberships. We had a significant number of things uh, that we were always doing. And of course, if we were going to the Kennedy Center, then we would go to dinner before. And that meant an expensive, usually restaurant, an Uber ride and all this other stuff. When you start combining all that stuff, it burns a lot of money. And it's something we enjoyed at the time, but we do not miss anymore. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Kennedy Center uh, membership, but we also had, in addition to the Kennedy Center membership, we had the National Theater membership. And we had, what was that theater on our street? That little uh, community theater. Yeah, the Keegan Theater. The Keegan Theater. Yeah. So we had so many of those. And it gave us such joy because we, we love performance. It. Um, but they added up and yeah. we need to replace that now. With and we're doing things. different things now. So it was a good at the time, but now we're redeploying that kind of money mm -hmm. other places. We also had to revamp other entertainment. So like around food and restaurants. Talk about yeah. that. We went out to eat a lot and enjoyed mm -hmm. it. And we live in DC, of course, it's a very expensive place. And then on top of very expensive, you add 10% uh, tax and 20% gratuity and the Uber ride over there and back and that kind of thing. So it was very expensive. We just don't do that anymore. We pretty much cook at home. We enjoy going out sometimes, but it, we really don't do it like we used to. We don't need to. We also entertain a lot at home. We have mm -hmm. friends over uh, for brunch or for dinner. We actually enjoy that more. We can have a better time and it's very inexpensive to do. We also had to uh, revamp vacations. So, you know, yeah. we didn't start loving travel just in retirement. We loved travel way before then. And in order to really be able to travel while we were working, we spent a lot of money to get the most experience that we can in the short two, if we were lucky, three week vacations that we would take. Talk yeah. about that. Well, time was precious and we were working and of course we were trying to get away from work. So, you know, we would stay in great hotels and take business mm -hmm. class here and do things that were more premium um, because it was such a limited time and limited experience. And we don't do that anymore. Uh, we haven't flown business class since we retired. We do premium economy. Um, we take another day or two to adjust when we get there and we can afford to do that. So um, now we can take what used to be a two or three weeks trip budget and we can stretch that into maybe two months and get a very different and actually much more rewarding experience because we're doing it on our own terms and we don't have a lot of stress and uh, need to get back home and get back to work. Now, one of the other things that we do is when it comes to our trips, we budget for a year, for yeah. the year. We budget way ahead of time. Can you talk about that cushion? So our budget that we work with the financial folks includes a budget for the year. And our strategy is, as we talked a little bit earlier about, we tried to bank some money before we 
uh, retired. So we're trying to pay kind of a year ahead. So we do things like Airbnbs um, for a month and that kind of thing. We have to book uh, cruises like the one we're on now, and you have to pay for those in advance. So our strategy is to try to, you know, budget annually, but also pay ahead. Um, so if we have anything that, you know, if times change, if something happens in the market, or if we decide that we want to tighten our belts a little bit, um, we're not in the moment. We can still travel and have time to adjust. Um, but then we've got the ability to kind of know that the next year is kind of already covered because we paid and budgeted accordingly. Now, one of the uh, things that you've become an expert on are credit cards. Mm -hmm. Talk about that and how you leverage that to Listen, make our dollar goals. Go we further. really pay attention to credit cards. Now, credit card reward programs, I have um, American Express. Um, I have uh, a couple of American Expresses. We do. We have Capital One. Uh, we have Chase and others. And depending on what you're doing, you got to kind of flex your points accordingly. So I always know to put travel on my Chase card because I get 3x points. Uh, but I put other stuff on Capital One or American Express because of different needs. So we've been able to really um, get benefit after paying the annual fees and that kind of stuff from all the perks. And we use them from airlines clubs to to getting clear, to getting... Um, you know, TSA and that kind of stuff, plus uh, just the miles. So much of our airfare is generally covered because we're using points and uh, we're pretty savvy about that. So pay attention to that because it really can make a big difference. So as you've probably deduced up to this point through our previous videos and what we've said so far, it's all about travel for us in retirement. So let's talk about money saving hacks specific to retirement. Let's start with uh, when we travel and how we save money that way. We travel on what they call shoulder season. Uh, because we're retired, we can plan our, our trips accordingly, right? So number one, it saves you money. Number two, you really avoid crazy um, crowds, kids, and other things. So we generally try to travel in shoulder where it's just past or just before the prime season where you get better rates, less crowds, and you can really enjoy the place. We also have very flexible itineraries. Sometimes we bump into our trips. Talk about that. Yeah, there's always a deal out there. So what we try to do is plan but have the plan a little bit in jello. So we pay attention to things like cancellation clauses. Um, in Airbnb, sometimes if you book for a month, uh, you're committed. Many times in many countries, there are provisions in place that allow you to cancel almost last minute. So we'll go ahead and, and book things. Um, but then if we have the ability and see an opportunity for a last minute deal or a last minute whatever it is, we'll actually change uh, and you know take advantage of those cancellation causes that allow us to then pivot and do something else on a great deal. It also allows us to balance things and balance in the sense that you know sometimes you're going to see us do some pretty luxury trips, yeah. but other times you're going to see uh, us traveling. I wouldn't say on a budget, but no. certainly not luxury. Reasonably. So let's talk about that balance that we have. Yeah, so I mean, if we go take a almost a month trip on a Viking in Egypt and Israel and Jordan, that's expending some money. But then we'll complement that um, with six weeks at our favorite place in Puerto Vallarta, where we're basically staying in a friend's place that's very reasonable, that we're very comfortable, and we're just vegging, which is very reasonable, not that much different from staying at home. So we really try to have those balances. We enjoy them both, but obviously there's different cost structures involved and we try to make sure that we balance all that out so we get full enjoyment and that we're not on a steady state of anything, either really expensive or really cheap, but we get the best of both. And something that you've become really good at is the smart exchange of money. Yeah. Talk about that and the use of ATMs and You got to really cards. pay attention to it. There's all kind of never accept the exchange on the ATM. Always decline that. You know, you can be anywhere in the world and they'll ask you to exchange um, and you always deny that. So do that. But we've also got a Charles Schwab account who we are not getting sponsored by but is amazing. We keep money in that account. We can use an ATM anywhere in the world and they give us great um, transaction fees in terms of the um, exchange. 
but they also refund 100% of ATM fees anywhere. So we keep money there and we can use the ATM card all over the world and it gives us a great exchange and it gives us our ATM fees back. Uh, we also are going to Buenos Aires soon and we keep up with things like the blue dollar and things that are legal, uh, but not always the, you know, the natural way you would do stuff. In Buenos Aires, you've got to pay attention to not using your credit cards, not exchanging money in banks, but doing it through Western Union and other things uh, that can get you almost double uh, the value that you would have otherwise. One of the biggest ticket items you'll have when you travel, uh, especially so travel, but any travel, is the cost of hotels and yeah, Airbnbs. Yeah. So let's talk about um, some of the money saving hacks that we use when it comes to saving money on our accommodations. Yeah. Hotels. On hotels, you know, what we found is if you book in advance, you really generally get a better deal. So we try to book in advance, but we have the ability to have a cancellation. And then once we've booked and have what we want, we continue to check back uh, over time to make sure we've got the best deal. And if the better deal comes up, then we cancel and rebook. So hotels really do come and go a lot. We try to book directly with the property. We check aggregators first, like Priceline or Kayak or whatever, and then book directly with the hotels. That's been a better experience mm -hmm. for us. One of the biggest surprises for me was the idea about rechecking hotels. Yeah. I was surprised to see how much the cost of a hotel can change over time. Like crazy. And if you recheck it, you can you can, you can really, lock in that lower you cost. You really can. The other thing is Airbnbs. Um, you know, if you most places, if you book an Airbnb for a month, you get a significant discount. Um, I've been places where we only wanted to stay there two weeks, and I actually booked for a month because with the monthly discount, two weeks was more expensive than staying a month. That was and a so, surprise. Yeah, and it happens a lot. So you got to really pay attention if you want to be somewhere for two weeks or more, always look for the monthly discount. Uh, and of course, on those as well, make sure you pay attention to the cancellation policies. Sometimes you're locked in. You pay and it's done, uh, at least for the first month. Many times you can cancel and adjust, and we've done that before as well. Mm -hmm. Even though we're talking about um, saving money when it comes to travel and specifically accommodation, one of the things we've learned, probably, well, no, that's a kind of the hard way, is to never skimp on your Airbnb. No. There are consequences to that. So talk about we, that. We, in our experience, you know, there's always a cheaper Airbnb. Um, but if you're going to stay there for an extended amount of time, make sure you don't go cheap. Um, we've uh, done it and really regretted it. So pay attention, look at the reviews. We don't book anything anymore that doesn't have significant reviews. Um, and we've really decided that, you know what, most of the time we want to pay what a two bedroom costs for a one bedroom because generally it's worth it. It's got the stuff we want. We want a certain level of comfort. We want a certain level of facilities and safety and of course location. And um, you know, it, you can always find a cheaper deal, but man, when you're living somewhere, especially as long as we do, you don't want to screw around and scrimp on an Airbnb. We never regretted having a great Airbnb and we have screwed up a time or two, not much, mm -hmm. uh, with the wrong one. Mm -hmm. And one of the other things that you, um, we encourage you to do and, and which will happen naturally, I think, is that over time as you travel, you're going to find those, those Airbnbs, those places, maybe hotels too, that you're going to go back to again and again. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they, you'll, the ones that you love and the ones that will be at a more reasonable price, yeah. you'll be able to like have that in your pocketbook and that'll be your go-to. Your place. We've got one of those in Mexico and we just love it. It's our place. And in fact, um, we wouldn't be any happier if we had our own place down there. We're just in mm -hmm. love with the place. Uh, we're very um, close and friendly with the owner and we absolutely love it. And it's very reasonable and it's a great spot. Oh, you know what? This reminds me of something. Don't do what we almost did. Don't buy a second home, no. a vacation home, a retirement home. Most of the people we know we've, who've done it, I mean, some love it, but others regret the investment that they've made and that requires them to go back there again and again. If you've ever seen our Merida, Mexico, no, not Merida, San Miguel, San Miguel. Allende, uh video on house hunting there where we almost bought a home 
we didn't in the end, but we are so glad that we didn't. Yeah, I owned a uh, second home before at the beach and we loved it, but I gotta tell you, in retirement, there's too many places to go, there's too much mm -hmm. to worry about, and uh, we'll never, I think, you know, Chris was always kind of there, but I was kind of in love with having our own little spot somewhere. Never, uh, we don't want that. We really want to find those places that we enjoy and get to use all the time we want and have none of the hassles, none of the worries of uh, ownership. Okay, so let's spend a little time on the essentials. Uh, when we say essentials, we mean like food and groceries and uh, regular bills, etc. So let's start with food. Yeah, with food. So even though accommodation is your biggest expense, you can spend a lot of money eating and drinking. And, uh, you know, it's okay, but you can spend a lot of money eating and drinking. So what we try to do is either get free breakfast if we're at a hotel, or we eat breakfast at home. We grocery shop and eat breakfast at home. Um, some places we even find, uh, like a place we're going to in the near future that has dinner included. So if you have the ability, especially with hotels, to get bored, uh, then do that. Um, but if we're in an Airbnb and we're just kind of on our own, we eat breakfast at home and then we eat out no more than once a day. We find that we can pretty much eat breakfast at home, eat a late, or a lunch or an early dinner, and that sustains us. Maybe we have something uh, if we need it late at night, but we try not to do that anyway. So you can really make sure you don't overspend on meals. Um, the other thing we do is we try to get um, plots de jour, or things that are prefixed, and we don't drink our budget away. There's a lot of money spent on alcohol and uh, other things like that. Sometimes it's cheaper than the Coke, but if you can really make sure you pay attention to where your money goes, you'll be a lot better off. Let's also mention about uh, how we save on phone and data. Yeah, fortunately, well, we're over. I'm over 55, so we have T-Mobile's plan, and uh, it's great. It includes data all over the world. So fortunately for us, that works. We have never, uh, because we have Wi-Fi in most places, uh, we have never had to buy eSIMs or go and buy you know, different kind of uh, cards uh, all over the world. So we use uh, T-Mobile, it's all included, and we found it gives us great service anywhere in the world. And then finally, transportation. So we mentioned how we um, sold our cars and we mainly use Uber and such, but there's still other ways to save money when it comes to that area. We love tr uh, public transportation. It's usually, depending on where you are, of course, um, safe and accessible and it takes you where you need to go and it's very reasonable. Um, we did it most, uh, have done it most places we've been. Um, and, you know, if we get to the point where that doesn't work for us or it's onerous to get there, we'll use an Uber or a taxi. But we've found that public transportation is great and we use it all over the world. So what does it all come down to, right? It comes down to we Experience. want to have experiences. That's why we travel. We want to um, see the world, meet people, experience things that are out of our comfort zone or that we haven't done before. So what are some of the ways that we maximize our ability to have really top-notch, really unique experiences. Yeah, I think the first thing is you don't have to be a tourist. If you're slow traveling, you can just be in the environment and enjoy it. And so much of the experience is just right there, just being there. Um, but the other thing is a lot of places we go, much of what we want to do is free, um, from museums to parks to art installations to whatever it is, roaming around the city. So a lot of that's free. All you need is a great pair of walking shoes and you can get out there and do it. Um, the other thing we do is we look for at Viator or Get Your Guide or other places that have uh, paid tours if we think it's something that's worth that. Uh, but uh, walking tours, free walking tours are always an option and in many places uh, you have things like hop on, hop off buses that take you around and different things. And you know, we have found that even the Airbnb hosts give us great uh, recommendations either directly or through the documentation they provide. So, you know, there's plenty of things to do. There's also different ways to do it. If you go to a museum, um, you may not need a personal guide. You can do things like the audio guide. And uh, we've really enjoyed that. And mm -hmm. it comes in your language if you're in a part of the country, of course, that 
uh, is not speaking uh, your primary language. So there's just different ways to get out there and do it. The other thing is Chris and I get out every day and we just roam around neighborhoods and experience and things. And some of the best things we've done have been things we've bumped into because we're really in the environment and we're meeting people in their space and just loving it. So uh, to me, that's what it's all about versus tours and you know things like we used to do back when we were working. Mm -hmm. Again, I think it comes back to balance. Uh, if you want a really good example of how we approach like museums, uh, go to our Paris destination series. Yeah. We talk about how for the Louvre, we definitely needed to get a paid guide to take us through the most important um, pieces yeah. within the museum because it's just so large and we only had so much time. But then some of the other smaller museums, we use the yeah, audio guide. Audio so, guide, yeah, great it's example. great. Yeah, but just get out there and do it. And uh, when you have the time and you have the inclination, uh, you pretty much have a wonderful experience. If you found this helpful, see our other videos on travel and money tips. See you in the next video.